Christianity is that uh, one of the messages that I tried to deliver is that Christianity is about standing. Uh, it's about kneeling, of course, before the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. But it's also about standing. And uh, whether you go back to the Old Testament and you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> taking their stand, 
in standing up against the idols of, of their day, uh, or whether it's Daniel himself doing it, or others who just stood for the Lord, whether it's Noah, what, you know, just being able to stand for the Lord. It doesn't mean we, we are on the march to attack. It doesn't mean that we're, we're trying to do that, but we're not certainly going to retreat. We're not going to turn our backs um, to that which God has called us to. Amen? And, and Amen. we're, we're, we're going to stand strong in the power of the Lord. And so we're going to talk about keeping them on standing. Today's message is called Living a Life of Integrity. And we're going to talk about integrity a little bit from a different perspective here, from a, from an angle maybe that you've not thought about integrity. And, uh, and so hopefully I'll be able to communicate that, get that across to you, because it's a little bit different approach to the idea of integrity. So let's take a look at this. Uh, once again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Um, here's what Peter says. He says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And now Peter quotes from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. He says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And uh, so basically he, what he's saying is we need to live a life of integrity. Um, and may God add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his holy word and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Um, let's pray for today's message. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause once again to thank you for the teachings of your Holy Word. Lord, we pray that you'd help us today to be better prepared, Father, for the struggles that may lie ahead because of the world in which we live today. Teach us how to live now, Lord, a life of integrity. Help us understand this. And, and Lord, we pray that you'd open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to the deeper truths that you'd have for us today. Father, we pray that you'd transform us by the use of your Holy Spirit, the power of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives, and you change us from the inside out. Lord, I ask that you'd use this message and messenger as you see fit. You do in every heart that which only you can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. For we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. amen and Amen. Peter has written this letter that we call 1 Peter to a group of Christians who were under tremendous pressure at the time. And not only that, but they were also headed toward even more serious days which were lying ahead. Peter warned them that those days were coming more difficult days were on their way. Peter wrote this little letter to them to help them to learn how to survive in the midst of the hostile world in which they were living at the time, knowing that perhaps, I think when Peter wrote this, that perhaps the Spirit of God would then take the application of this letter and apply it to the hearts of men and women just like you and I, who we ourselves also live in a day where we're living in a world of danger as well and growing hostility to Christianity as well. And uh, so I think what he wrote back then applies certainly to us today as well. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And the dangers we face today may not necessarily be from outward attacks of terrorists who seek to eradicate Christianity from the face of the earth. Certainly those individuals are there. And, but I, I think the real danger that we face is from an inward as well as outward pressure of a greater enemy than any terrorist the world has ever known before. He, he is the greatest terrorist who ever lived, and that, of course, is Satan himself. Amen? Amen? I mean, he is the one who's on the march, and we have to be aware of that. You and I, as believers in Christ, have been called to live in a certain way in this world, even as we approach the end of days. Even as we approach the return of Christ, we're still commanded to live certain ways. God has given us a manual to help us know what to do and how to function as Christians in this kind of growing hostility, though. He's instructed us how to do this. So perhaps more than anything else, as we try to walk through this sin-stained world today, it's important to know what we believe. We have to know what we believe and why we believe it. It's important to understand also that our salvation produces hope in our lives. That because we're saved, we have a hope. And that hope that we have is for the future. And that future hope becomes the anchor of our soul today. Amen? Amen? It's what holds us. It's what anchors us. The hope of what's coming, the hope of who's coming, anchors us into the reality. It gives us the ability to continue to stand and to stay steady right now. We're called to live out our faith in the midst of a very hostile and sin-laden world. And as the pressures of this world and as the pressures of Satan come against us today as never before, 
God has called each of us to keep on standing, to stand in the faith, to stand firmly so that we'll not surrender to the pressures of this world system. And the pressures are certainly on. Um, but I am pleased and happy to tell you that more and more Christians are beginning to stand. They're beginning to stand up and not shrink back. They're beginning to take their stand. And I'm, I'm as pleased as anything to see that happening. And we need to be counted among those who are standing. Amen? Amen. We don't want to be the ones who are left uh, not standing when Jesus returns. We want to be standing with all of our brothers and sisters like that. In the passage we're looking at today, as simple as it may appear at first reading, I believe that Peter has, uh, Peter has really crystallized for us how indeed we're to survive in this world that God has called us to serve in in these last days. So here indeed is a call to integrity. Now I have to tell you though that later on in the book of 1 Peter, Peter's going to be telling us about some intense suffering that I think all of us are going to have to face and how we're going to have to deal with that. But, but first of all, he talks about protecting our integrity. That's kind of where he begins with this. And, and integrity is a wonderful word, but it's a word that isn't used very much anymore because frankly it's a word that's been violated so much. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't expect integrity of most people anymore. In fact, most people expect the worst of most people, right? So we don't talk about integrity much, but integrity really is a, it's kind of an unusual word, and especially the way I think that Peter is implying its use here. Because the word integrity means wholeness. That's what integrity means. It means wholeness. It means to be all together, to be integrated. That's the first key thought there. The word integrity means to be integrated, it means wholeness, it means to be all together, to be integrated. I, I like that term integrated because it, it, that's what integrity means, to be integrated. Um, when somebody says they're getting it together, you know, and then I'm, I'm getting my life all together, what they mean is they're heading toward integrity, mm -hmm. right? I'm getting my life all together now. Well, that means you're heading toward integrity. You're, you're, you're moving toward wholeness. You're moving to more integration in, as to who you should be, as to who you really are. A man who is in Christ Jesus is a man who is of one whole piece. Amen? Amen. I mean, we're one now. He's not a fraction of a man, but he's a totally integrated person now. And that's what Peter wants for us to understand. Before we were saved, we were incomplete. We were not integrated. We really had no idea and under, uh, of understanding in regards to integrity because we didn't know the author of integrity. Amen? Mm -hmm. We didn't know him. But once we know Jesus Christ, we become then a whole person. Before we were saved, we're incomplete. But now, after we're saved, we are whole. We may not always feel that way, but we are. That's who we are. If we're to survive in a hostile culture in which we live and are quickly entering into, Peter wants us to become to understand that we are totally integrated as men and women who are a part now of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not to be fragmented, but to be integrated one with another. Amen? Amen. We're to be so connected because we are connected by the same Holy Spirit. We are one body. Amen? Yep. One family. That's, that's what the Bible teaches. We have to learn to understand how to live as a whole person now in a fractured world. We need to be men and women of integrity, whole people in the midst of a world of shattered people. Do you realize, do you understand that that's really the one thing that sets us apart from everybody else? Mm -hmm. Is the fact that when other people are fractured and shattered, they look at us and they see somebody who's whole. Mm -hmm. They see somebody who's complete. They see somebody who knows how to be happy no matter what. Mm -hmm. They see that in us. They should see that in us. And I think in the last days, this character trait of wholeness or integrity, being integrated, is the one thing that will cause us to stand out like nothing else. Um, especially how we deal with the hostility that moves toward us. In the verses we're looking at today, Peter has outlined for us three things that we need to guard against. In fact, I wrote that on your outline that Peter gives us three things we need to protect in order for us to maintain our integrity. Three things we need that will protect us from being captured, I think, by the philosophies of the world and all of its phony theories, theories like humanism and communism and socialism and evolution and all these other theories, which are being heavily promoted today. Uh, integrity is what will help us to stand against these things. 
So here's the first thing Peter wants us to learn. Here's number one on your outline. And Peter tells us, first of all, it's important to guard our attitude towards other believers in Christ. This is what helps us to understand how to be integrated. We, we have to guard our attitude toward other believers in Christ. It keeps us from looking fragmented and looking more integrated. You know, Christians can look fragmented. I mean, it, it just depends on our understanding of who we really are in Christ. We can either appear to be fragmented or we can be who we really are and be that whole person God wants us to be. Amen? We can be that. But again, it's a choice we have to make, and that's why Peter writes us. He's, he's telling us, be who you are. Be who God has now saved you to be, created you and saved you to be. Look at the next verse, 1 Peter 3, 8. Peter says, finally, all of you, finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, and be courteous. We're going to take a moment. We're going to tear that verse apart just a little bit here. Uh, we all know what the word finally means when he says finally, all of you. Finally just means to sum it all up. That's what he's saying, to sum it all up or to crystallize it, to, to capture it all in one thought. Uh, he says, here are some things you need to remember. Finally, remember this. Guard your attitude toward other believers. Guard your attitude toward them. Now, there's a variety of ways that we could look at this verse today. But as I study this a little bit more closely, it seems to me that what Peter's trying to get us to see, what Peter does, is he puts his finger on the things that has a tendency to destroy the oneness or the wholeness of God's people in the world today. So instead of looking at the phrases positively, I think we need to look at these, ter at these in terms of that which they deny. Uh, in, a, in other words, that which they keep us from. So he, he, he says it in a positive way, you know, be this, be this, be this, but here's the reason you need to be this. It keeps us from this, right? And so we need to look at that which he's keeping us uh, from by doing that which he tells us to do. For instance, here's the first sub point on your outline there. There is a danger of dividing over secondary issues. And, and, and I think what he's telling us to do keeps us from, from doing that. There is a danger of dividing over secondary issues. A life of integrity keeps that from happening. Peter said in the next verse on your outline, in 1 Peter 3, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind. Be of one mind. Have you noticed, though, how easily believers today tend to get divided over what we would call secondary issues? How easily we get divided over stuff? I mean, you know, the truth is, just about every church in America today, and I'm talking about the true church, the, the true evangelical church in America, true Bible-believing evangelical churches, the, the real ones, um, there's very little division that occurs in those churches over doctrine. Did you know that? Very few truly Bible-believing evangelical churches ever get divided over doctrine. They cling to the doctrine. They hold to the doctrine because that's primary. Amen? Yes. That's primary to our salvation. It's primary to our understanding of what it means to be saved. And so they cling to that. But most of our divisions tend to be over secondary issues like methodology, how we get it done, how we do things. Um, so they, they, they have to do with secondary issues that we can't find a, a clear piece of scripture to determine which way we should go or not go. You know? And so secondary issues like, like how should we do this? Should we go and pick it or should we not go pick it? You know? Should we go and march against these or should we not? You know? and these, are, these are secondary issues because we're commanded in scripture to do what? To stand. That's what we're commanded to do. So those are second. Those are methodology issues. Do we go march? Do we not go march? Do we do we pick at this place? Do we not pick at this place? You know, how do we deal with this? And so sometimes people get. I mean, in some churches. I mean, I grew up in a in a church that got divided over the color of the carpet that they wanted to buy. And uh, I, I mean, it, talk about a secondary issue. That's that's not even that even hit the radar. But how many churches divide over silly stuff like that? And, and so people just get angry at one another and they're like that. We get all hung up on these things and before long we lose sight of the real issues that are truly important and that's the plan of the, of the devil. That's his ploy. If he can get us hung up on secondary stuff, then we miss doing the primary things that God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and so Peter says to believers in Christ, finally, all of you be of one mind. Don't miss the important thing here. Be of one mind about the things that are really important. Now, Peter's not telling, uh, talking here about uniformity because there is a difference between unity and uniformity. There's a big difference. Uniformity is everyone determined to act exactly alike. That's uniformity. That's, that's, the, 
That's one of the doctrines of communism. That's one of the doctrines of socialism. Everybody has to be the same. Everybody has to act alike and do alike and be alike. When, when Satan takes control of this world, that's going to be what he demands is uniformity. Everybody has to do what he's told to do and she's told to do by the Antichrist, by the ruler, by the one government, by the one world order. Everybody has to fall into line in this. In communism in China, that's what it's about. I mean, if you study Chinese communism, you, you'll discover that everybody there is expected to toe the line. They're expected to do what they're told to do. That's uniformity. But that's not what Peter's talking about. In fact, Peter's talking, here's the next key thought on your outline. Here's what Peter's talking about. Unity, really, is the desire to cooperate in the midst of diversity. That's what unity really is. It's the desire to cooperate in the midst of diversity. Unity involves a determination to be cooperative with other believers, even though we may not always see eye to eye with them, we're still going to cooperate. We're still going to be involved with each other. Peter says, listen, if you're going to survive in this hostile world and maintain your integrity, maintain your wholeness, then first of all, you're going to have to guard your attitude toward other believers, and so there's this danger of dividing over secondary issues. Secondly, number two, Peter says, there's a danger then of developing a hardness toward the needs of other believers within the body. There is a danger of developing a hardness toward the needs of other believers in the body. Um, the next verse on your outline there, 1 Peter 3, 8. Peter says, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Say that last phrase, having, say that with me. Having, having compassion for one another. In other words, having sympathy for one another. In other words, we have to be able and willing to share both the joys and the sorrows of each other within the body of Christ. Um, we're to rejoice when folks rejoice. We're to be happy when they're happy. Yeah. We're to celebrate when they celebrate. Amen? Amen. We're, we're to do that. But we're also to become the wounded person in the midst of their agony as well. We need to experience the wounds that they experience. We need to feel that. Um, but isn't it true, and let's just be honest, that within our culture and even within our generation, it's becoming increasingly easy for us to hear about the suffering and pain and hurt of other brothers and sisters and hardly be touched by it at all. Uh, we just tend to say, ah, it's just too bad, and, and we just kind of walk on by. We, we tend to think, well, somebody else is going to take care of that, but, but I don't need to get involved. And, and we tend to just ignore it. Peter says, look, if you're going to guard your attitude toward your fellow believers in Christ, especially in the last days, along with being sure that you aren't divided by secondary issues and maintain your unity in the Lord, you also have to guard against the hardness that can come into your soul especially after you've been a believer for a number of years and you walk by people who are hurting and you don't see them, much less feel what they're going through anymore. We've got to get back to that. Amen? That's what he's saying. You've got to guard against that. And it's amazing how personal pain can resensitize you to the pain that others are going through. Uh, in other words, once you go through it, it makes you real sensitive to other people who go through it. Amen? I mean, for example, I never really understood the pain and hurt that a person really goes through when they have to watch a loved one go through the heartbreak of Alzheimer's. Uh, at least until I had to go through it with my mom. And it's amazing how that caused me to develop a sensitivity and a heart for those going through it like I never had before. And so now all of a sudden, I, I instantly have a heart connection for anybody who's having to deal with that. I have a compassion for them like I never had before because I understand it much better than I ever understood it before. Now, I had compassion for folks dealing with that before my mom had Alzheimer's. I had compassion for them. At least I would try to sympathize, but nothing like after I experienced and went through it myself. Amen? Amen. And I think jointly together, we have to share those experiences enough to be able to say, here's what it's like, guys. So it helps increase the capacity that we have for loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. So we share that. We have, to, we have to understand that a little bit. So Peter says, be careful. There's a danger of developing a hardness toward the needs of others in the body of Christ with you. But not only that, number three, Peter says, there's a danger of denying a fellow believer their right within the family. There is a the danger of denying a fellow believer their right within the family. And it is a, a right that they have. Mm -hmm. um, look at what Peter says, 1 Peter 3, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, Love as brothers. Say that with me. Love, Love as, as brothers. brothers. Now, that's one of Peter's favorite themes there, and I'm, I'm reminded how easily it is to forget that we are a family. 
we're a family. That's the implication there. Love as brothers because we're a family. If, if your human family, in your human family, if someone in that family, if something happened to someone in that family that was out of your control, and let's say, let's say maybe a, a child is born to your family who has some kind of a birth defect or something like that. I, I can promise you that if you're a godly family, it makes no difference that that child has a birth defect. Amen. It makes no difference to the family. That child is going to be just as much loved and just as appreciated within that family as any other family member would be. Amen? Amen. It, it doesn't matter. In, in fact, if you talk to someone who has a child with problems like that, they'll tell you that that child actually ends up being the one who gets the most love from everyone because the other the other children in the family they just tend to gather together and shepherd that that child they they, they want to help that child and, and and they put their arms around that child they, they protect that child they help nurture that child and and uh, that's just the way we are that's the way we should be and that's that's what should happen within the family of christ as well because sometimes my my heart gets a little broken when I think about when I see how sometimes we treat some of our brothers and sisters in the family of God. Sometimes it does break my heart a little bit. And, and, I mean, we may have some brothers or sisters who come to, not, not this church, I've not seen that happen here, but in other churches I've seen it happen that I've been a part of. And, and they come to church and they may not be the sharpest tool in the shed all the time. And, and, or, or sometimes they may not have the best of clothes or... or Maybe they don't have the same social graces that we feel are important for folks to be able to move in the circles in which we move in. And, and so how do, we, how do we treat them? You know, um, Sometimes we just pass on by them like <clears throat> they're not even there. We push them away. We never include them in our circle of friends. You know, They're kind of on the outside there. And perhaps we get a little embarrassed when they approach us and we try to stay away from them or we try to keep other people away from them to avoid them. It, it's not that they're doing anything wrong. It's just that they don't seem to measure up to our personal standards mm -hmm. that they ought to have as a part of this church family. You know, and, and so when that happens, in essence, we deny them their right as a full brother or sister in the family of God. And, and that's why Peter says, if you're going to survive in this world, if you're going to maintain your integrity as believers in Christ, then don't deny your fellow believers their rights within the family of believers. Don't deny them their right of full acceptance and full fellowship with everyone. Amen? Amen. Amen? We all have a right to that because we're all brothers and sisters in the family of God. And everybody Amen. said, Amen. Amen. Amen, here you are. But then number four, Peter goes on to remind us that there is a danger of dealing with doctrine coldly. There is a danger of dealing with doctrine coldly. Now, Peter goes on to say in this next verse, 1 Peter 3, Finally, all of you, <clears throat> be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted. Say that. Be, be tenderhearted. Tender now that stands in opposition to being hard-hearted. The opposite of tenderhearted is hard-hearted. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can get so involved in theological truth and doctrinal truth that we, when we go out and try to impact our world, we, we go to try to change people with doctrine. We think doctrine is what's going to change people. Doctrine is important. And it's especially important to the growing Christian. Do you know when doctrine becomes important to you and I? It becomes important to you and I after we're saved. Mm -hmm. But not before. Amen. I, I'm going to be honest with you. People who aren't saved really don't care about doctrine. Amen. They don't. But to you and I who are saved, it becomes critically important. Doctrine is important, especially to a growing Christian. It's important to kind of understand Greek and Hebrew in our studies of God's Word. It's, it's important to understand some of that. It's important to know theology. It's important to have good exegesis being done. It's, it's important. But, but listen, good theology without tender-hearted application doesn't mean much to anybody. Mm -hmm. We are very sophisticated in our knowledge of the Word of God, and we have had advantages, you know, that no other generation has ever had. I mean, in terms of books and publications, and research, and copies of scripture, and radio, and internet, and television, and lots and lots of good Bible teachers. We have more than we know what to do with now. But listen, folks, all that knowledge in God's Word without a tender heart towards people has really no impact on others at all. It's the old saying that I'm sure you've heard many times that, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Yeah. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
And we need to understand that. So that's why Peter is saying, when it comes to other believers, be careful that you don't develop cold-heartedness toward doctrine and then ignore the need for, of love for your fellow believers and other people. The doctrine that we learn has to be warmed and lovingly applied to other people. Amen? Um, look at what Paul said in the next verse on your outline, Ephesians 4.32. Paul said this, he said, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, there's that word, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you, be kind and forgive. That's, that's what a tender heart does. Amen? <clears throat> it's so easy to get so technical about what we believe that we totally ignore the purpose of believing it. And so Peter says there's a danger in dealing with doctrine coldly. And then notice number five, the next verse. <clears throat> there's also a danger of undermining, or determining, rather than undermining, there's a danger of determining that we're better than others. There's a danger of determining that we're better than others. This is the last thing he says in that verse. If we're not careful, we can ruin our integrity, our, our integration with God and with one another. We can ruin that with other believers by determining that somehow we're better than they are. And somehow we're better than others. Look at what Peter says in, the, in this next verse, 1 Peter 3, 8. Again, he says, Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted and be courteous. Say that. Be, be courteous. courteous. Be courteous. Now, the word for courteous is the Greek word, and it's a word that literally means humility. To be courteous means to be humble. You can't be courteous unless you're humble, right? For example... If I'm courteous, would you say that I'm being courteous if I hold the door for you? Yes. yes. You know what that requires? Humility. Humility. Because in other words, I'm saying you go first, right? A humble person steps aside and lets another person go. That's, that's an expression of humility. So that's why these words are connected. There's, courteous means humility, means to be humble. A humble-minded person doesn't put himself ahead of others, but he willingly places himself as a servant of others. And of course, the great example we have of that is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Scripture says that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen? Yeah. He became, that's true humility there. You see, if we're not careful, it's very easy for, for any believer to become like a Pharisee. In, in that we take pride in what we know, and so we begin to think we're better than others because of what we know, you know. I don't mean to pick on anybody, but it kind of bothers me when I hear somebody say, well, I'm a member of a full gospel church. Now, that kind of bothers me a little bit. I'm a member of a full gospel church. Now, I don't agree doctrinally with some of those brothers in, in the full, that particular denomination, but it kind of bothers me when they say that because it, it almost sounds like, it, it almost sounds kind of pharisaical. I'm a member of the full, full gospel church, and you're not. Right? I mean, I'm a member of the full gospel church, and you're, you're not. Um, it's like they've got something that I don't have. They've got the gospel, and I don't really have it. <laughs> They've got it, none. We poor Baptists, we don't get it. <laughs> Listen, the only gospel that any of us have is what's in this book called the Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're all reading the same Bible. We all have the same gospel. See, we don't have a right to get proud about what we have and what others may not have. If we're going to have integrity in the body of Christ, if we're going to guard that, then we need to make sure that we're not, that we, that we are um, determining in our own minds, that we are not really any better than anybody else. We're just humble-minded people saved by grace. Amen. That's what we are. So let me just review all this real quick. If we were to survive in a hostile world, Peter says, as a result of being integrated, of being a people of integrity, that we need to make sure that we guard our attitude toward our fellow believers and we do that by being sure that we're not dividing over secondary issues, that we're not developing a hardness toward other believers' needs, that we're not denying other believers their rights in the family, and that we're not d dealing with doctrine coldly, and then number five, that we're not determining that we are better than other believers. We have to be careful about that. Folks, this is how we guard our attitude toward other believers. Now, if we could just grab a hold of these five things, I'm telling you, if, if we as Christians would just really hang on to those five things, I, I don't believe that there would be much division in any church. Amen. I don't believe any, I just don't believe there would be. Think, these are guaranteed things. These are things that God says will work. 
I guarantee they'll work. If you put them to work, they'll work. But notice Peter, Peter doesn't stop with the body of Christ here. That's the easy part, okay? And that's the long part of the message. So the rest of it's going to go quicker. So don't, don't panic, all right? So first, first point was the long part, all right? So, but this is, this is the more difficult part. Number two, Peter goes on to say, it's important to guard our attitude toward our enemies. It's important to guard our attitude toward our enemies. Look at what Peter says in the next verse on your outline there. He says, 1 Peter 3, 9, he says, Not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. In other words, if you're going to get a blessing, you've got to what? Be a blessing, right? Yeah. Peter says we have to guard our attitude though toward our enemies. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but life in our world is really lived on three levels. First, the first level is the satanic level. That's where people live their lives a lot of times. And the satanic level, it goes like this. They return evil for good. That's the satanic level. That's how people live. They'll return evil for good. That's the satanic level. Do you know any folks like this? I do. Yes. I mean, I, I know folks who, you do something good for them, they're just going to turn right around and do evil toward you. They, they don't care you did good for them. They're going to keep doing evil toward you. They're going to keep knocking you down. They're going to keep pushing you down. It doesn't matter what you do for them. They're going to keep doing that. I know people like that. Secondly, some people live life on the human level. There's the satanic level and there's the human level. And uh, in other words, that, that sounds like this, that, that, that uh, somebody does good to you and so they're going to do good to them. You know, if, if you do good to them, they'll do good to you. But if you do evil to them, then they're going to turn right around and do that to you. They're going to do evil to you. In other words, it's a, they live on a tit for tat type of thing. Whatever you do to me, I'm going to give it right back to you. I'm just going to do it right back to you. That's what you, you give it to me, I'm going to give it right back to you. It's a tit for tat. So the satanic level, human level. But thirdly, God has called us to live on the divine level. That's, that's the third and highest level. It's the divine level. And that's what that says is this. When people do evil to us, we do good to them. So in other words, we're not going to do evil for evil. We're going to do good for evil. Amen? Amen? And frankly, folks, only God can help you do that. Amen. Because that's not a natural thing to do. It requires supernatural invention to be able to do that. That's why we read what Jesus said in the next passage on your outline, Luke 6, 22 and 27 and 28. And there Jesus said this, Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and praise, pray for those who spitefully use you. Folks, that's not a human response. That's a divine response. Somebody does something to hurt us, somebody says something to damage us, and they try to put our name in a bad light, the first thing we tend to want to do is to go out and get even with them. That's the first, that's the natural response. That's the human level. That's what we want to do. The first thing we tend to do is we want to get even. But Peter says that if you're going to be able to keep on standing in this world with your integrity intact, then with your wholeness intact, you've got to guard against your attitude against your enemies. You've got to guard against that. Uh, you've got to you've got to do it God's way, Amen. not the world's way. Peter was writing to a group of Christians who were living under Roman domination of Nero, and Nero and his cohorts were doing all that they could to make life miserable for those early Christians. Um, and, and so you can see how these Christians could have easily developed an attitude of hatred toward the Roman guards, toward the Roman garrison, toward the Roman emperor, toward Joe Biden, toward the. I mean, you know, they, they could have developed this hatred toward them because of what they were doing. Amen. Because of how they were treating them. Because of their deliberate abuse. I said that because I want you to connect it to our day as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going through the same thing. Peter's saying, look, it, it, you, can, you can respond to them with hatred. That's your choice. If you want to do that, you can do that. But if you do that, it's only going to ruin you because it's not going to affect them one little bit. How you treat them doesn't affect them. It only affects you. Uh, I mean, you can write all the angry letters in your mind that you want to. Right? Uh, and believe me, I've written them. I've, I've sat down and thought about all the things I want to say to our current president. I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of things I would love to say. And none of them were nice. And then I back up and I go, wait a minute, though, that's not helping me. That's not changing anything. That's not, that's not reality. That's not who I am anyway. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm not that person. Not anymore. So, I have to pray for him. I have to pray for him and pray. I have to pray for our, our government. I have to pray for those who are leading us astray. I have to pray for them. Amen. And, and, I, and I can't have a hatred there for them. I can't. If I do, it only ruins my life. Peter's saying this. I, he says, I'm vividly aware of what you're going through, Peter says. And, and you know, Peter is vividly aware of that. You know that, right? I mean, he, I mean, because if you remember, when Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, uh, with Jesus and when Jesus was being arrested, Peter got so angry that he cut off one of the guard's ears, ears with a sword went while Jesus was being arrested. I, I think Peter was going for his head, but he wasn't a very good swordsman, so he only got his ear. Um, and, and then you remember Jesus had to put it back on. Jesus had to heal it back up. But you know, later on, after the resurrection and after the ascension of Jesus Christ, Peter finally started getting it. Peter finally started to understand because we find Peter in jail shortly after that. He's been arrested. He's thrown in jail for preaching. And, and, uh, and this time, he doesn't resort to violence. He resorts to the power of prayer on behalf of the church. The church begins to pray for him, and he begins to pray in, in there, and he begins to sing. He watches as God goes to work on his behalf. Peter put himself in the Lord's hands. So Peter, I think, is uniquely gifted to write to us about this, and Peter's the one who tells us that as believers, we're the ones who have to return blessing for cursing. As believers, we're the ones who have to return kindness for cruelty. We've got to be the ones who do that. And, and we have to return mercy for meanness. I mean, that's not something we do easily, no. especially when the kind of pressure we're facing is on. But if we're going to stay standing in this world and maintain our integrity, then we have to guard our attitude toward our enemies. Number three, I know a lot of this is intellectual. I know a lot of this is taking it, and you've got it, but you, you, you've got to know that right now, in order to be able to stand, we're being attacked intellectually. We're being attacked intellectually. We are. Uh, we have to go back to the intellect of God's word to be able to defeat the intellectual attacks of the world. Amen? We, we have to do that. So that brings us to number three. It is important to guard our attitude toward life itself. It's important to guard our attitude toward life itself. In the remaining verses of this passage, Peter now quotes from the 34th Psalm, which is a wonderful passage out of the Old Testament. And I think that the reason Peter puts this in here is that if you're a Christian living in Rome and you read all this stuff that Peter has written, the conclusion that you would have drawn is that things are bad and they're getting worse. <laughs> they're just going to get worse. And, and so what would your attitude be if you weren't very careful about that? What would your attitude be? Well, I mean, you begin to think, well, what's the use? I mean, life's going to end anyway, so don't plan, don't do anything. I might as well just wait for the inevitable. I'm going to die. They're coming after me anyway. I mean, Rome is going to kill all of us anyway, so life's a drudgery, so why go on? Just end it all. This. Just forget it. I mean, you ever get to that place? You ever just want to run away from it all? <laughs> just want to run away from it all? Someone said that life for most people is lived in three different ways. Some people endure it as a burden. Some people try to escape from it, and we see that all the time when people crawl into alcohol or they crawl into drugs or they just run off. They, that's how they escape life itself. That's one of the methods they use, and or television or their phones or internet or something. They, they're using something to run away. So you either endure it or you escape from it. But then the third way is that some people choose to enjoy life. That's it. They just choose to enjoy it. And, and this is what Peter's saying. He's saying, look, I, I know that things are bad and you're going through persecution and there's not much human hope, but enjoy your life. <laughs> I know there's not much hope. I mean, you look around and you go, eh, things are falling apart. Enjoy your life. And we want to say, are you kidding me, Peter? I mean, you're telling us about all this bad stuff that's coming our way and you tell us to enjoy life, but that's exactly what Peter's saying because Peter knew on the basis of all the people he knew that enjoyment of life is not based on outward circumstances, but it's based on what's going on inside of you. And as we look at these last couple of verses, I think that you're going to find that Peter says some surprising things about enjoying life. I mean, if, we're all, if I were a humanist up here today trying to tell you how to enjoy life as a humanist, I would say things like, you got to eat the right food, man. I mean, you got to get the right stuff. And, and you got to get more exercise. you got to exercise. Now, this is all good advice, but as a humanist, that's the best I can do. Okay? 
you got to get good exercise and you got to stay away from the stress, man. You got to, you got to find a climate in the country where the weather's not too hot and not too cold, but it's just perfect all year long. And that's where you got to go, man. You got to, and, 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 and we think that we're going to enjoy life more if we get the conditions outside of us better. If we make the conditions better, then we're going to enjoy life more. But Peter's going to give us a little spiritual, holistic lesson here. Here's number one on your outline. First of all, Peter says, if you're going to enjoy life, you've got to make a conscious decision to enjoy life. That's where it starts. And frankly, to be honest, it pretty much ends there as well. It starts there and pretty much ends there. You've got to make a conscious decision to enjoy life. Look at what he says in the next verse, 1 Peter 3.10. For he who would love life and see good days. Now, a little tr literal translation of that is, for he who would determine to love life. That's what he's talking about. He who would make that determination. In other words, you have to decide. You've got to make a determination that no matter what goes on, I'm determined that I'm going to love this life that God has given to me. It is a gift from God no matter how long I've got. And so i got to love it. The writer of Ecclesiastes who tried to figure out life without God, remember Solomon? He said that, therefore, I hated life because it is a vanity and a vexation of spirit. That's what Solomon said. He said, I tried to figure out life without God and I hated it. In other words, life without God, no matter how good it is on the outside, and, and, and Solomon had everything. He had it all. But he said it always ends up at the same point. You end up hating life. If you try to do life without God, you're going to end up hating it. But life with God, on the basis, basis of your conscious decision to love it, can get you through the stress of it, no matter what comes your way. But it's a decision. It's a determination we make. I mean, I don't know why people think that as Christians, we have to go around looking like a bunch of rejects from the dill pickle factory all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's true. I mean, I... We just kind of look so sad all the time. Why would anyone know? want to be a Christian? Well, exactly. I mean, they look at us and they think, good grief, whatever they got, I don't want any. You know, uh, no thank you. I, but Peter's saying, look, just determine to love life. Really love it. Enjoy life. Whatever you life you have or have left, just determine to love it. We spend so much of our life just being depressed all the time. And life is to be enjoyed in love. I think you can love life and be in pain. I think you can love life and be sad at the same time. You can still love life. Then Peter goes on to say something that doesn't seem to fit here, but I think the psalmist is really on to something here. Here's point number two on your outline there. If you're going to enjoy life, you have to make a concerted effort to control your tongue. <laughs> if you're really going to enjoy your life now, once you make that decision, then you've got to make a concerted effort to control your tongue. And this is important to integrity. This is important to being an integrated person. Fully integrated in the body of Christ. Integrated with God and integrated with one another. Look at the next verse, 1 Peter 3.10. He says, For he who would love life, whoever determines to do that and see good days, if you're determined to do that, then let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. you got to control it. James tells us that our tongue, James says that our tongue is the smallest member, but it has so much power for getting us into trouble. Do you know that if we could take a survey of our lives and we put all of the trouble that we've ever been through in our lives, if we took all, if we could just gather it all together and put it over in a pile over here, all the trouble that we've been through, everything that we've experienced that's troublesome and troubling and everything, and we put it all on a pile here, I just wonder, if we were able to examine that pile, I just wonder how much of it would be the result of our lack of ability to control our tongue. How much of it would be the result of things that we said that we shouldn't have said or things that we should have said and didn't say, but it created so much trouble because we didn't really control our tongues. We're always talking when we should be quiet. Uh, and we don't always tell the truth, do we? I mean, uh, that's, that's kind of problematic. <laughs> I've talked with people who have lived deceitful lives. <laughs> I've talked with people who have lived deceitful lives. And <laughs> not I didn't mean to look at you. I, was, I, was just, I thought you were like, I go, wait, wait, wait. No, but I've talked with people who have lived deceitful lives, and, and they can't understand why they don't have good relationships. <laughs> they, they just can't figure it out. I, I mean, seriously. I mean, I've sat in counsel with people whose life is just one deceitful act after another. They lie to their spouse, they lie to their kids, they lie to everyone, and, and they can't figure out why their relationships are just 
They can't figure it out. Lies and deceitfulness always destroys relationships. Always. And it destroys all kinds of relationships, whether it's with employers, employees, I mean, you name it. Lies and deceitfulness destroys relationships. You can't really make it in the world if you don't have integrity with your speech and with your life. Amen? Amen. Not, not the way God wants us to make it. You just can't do it. I love this little prayer in Psalm 141.3, the next verse on your outline there. In fact, this is one that, that's well worth memorizing. It says this. It says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I love that. That's a great prayer, right? Read that with me. Let's read that out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. What a great prayer. Sometimes before Cindy and I have to go to an important meeting of some kind or we have to make a decision of some kind, we, we kind of admonish each other and we remind each other we've got to be careful what we say. We just kind of say that. Just, just remember, we got to be careful what we say, you know, because because the truth is, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble when we don't control what we say, uh, and 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 not a lot of people. And, and to, to be honest, you know, um, criminals are the worst at this. <laughs> Have you noticed that? I mean, when criminals get, I, I watch a lot of the, the, those cop shows, and, and and people always they just talk too much. And they say things that get themselves in trouble all the time or get somebody else in trouble all the time. They just, they, they can't control their tongue. It really does require supernatural control. Amen? Amen. I mean, God has, we have to yield it to God in order to do that. Uh, so it's important that we learn to control our tongue. Number three, if you're going to enjoy life, then you also have to make a commitment to turn from any known sin and live righteously. You've got to make a commitment to turn from any known sin and live righteously. Now, look at the next verse on your outline, 1 Peter 3.11. He goes on to say, let him turn away from evil and do good. And what he's talking about? Repentance, right? That's what repentance is. Let him turn from evil and do good. This is so basic and this is so simple, I'm almost embarrassed to say it. But if you're not really enjoying your life, one of the reasons could be that you're not living it right. Amen. Or righteously. I mean, it could be that there's a sin that you're still hanging on to that you've got to get rid of. And it may be a, something that you think, well, it's just a little sin. It's not a big one. It's not, really, it's not really hurting other people. Yeah, it's hurting you. And, and it's keeping you from the joy that God wants you to have. Um, sin never stays small, though. It doesn't stay small. It always grows. That's true. But sometimes we, we kind of think, and, and, and it, grows, it grows whether we acknowledge it or not. It still grows. See, you're not going to enjoy life or love your life if you've got one foot still planted in the devil's territory and one foot, one foot planted in God's territory, and you're trying to live in both worlds at the same time. You can't remain standing that way. Amen. You're going to be pulled down. You're going to, be, you're going to fall. It, it's going to happen. It, it doesn't matter if God owns the whole farm. But you've given the devil a little section right in the middle of it because Satan's still going to stomp all over God's territory to get to that which is his. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we need to do is we need to give the devil an eviction notice from our lives. Amen? Mm -hmm. We need to evict him from our hearts and from our lives. And we do that through repentance. We do that by confessing it to God, asking his forgiveness and power to overcome it, and then rejecting it, just walking away from it. And then, I mean, when we do that, the joy of life comes back. And then number four. If you're going to enjoy life, you have to make a constant direction toward peace. Just write that in. There. You got to make a constant direction toward peace. The next verse there, First Peter three eleven, he says, "Let him seek peace and pursue it." Jesus said, "Blessed are the peacemakers." Blessed are the peacemakers. Now listen, how are you going to survive? How are you and I going to survive what's ahead? How are we going to be able to keep standing? How are we going to maintain our integrity and live as a whole person, as a, as a whole Christian, in a culture that's much like it was in Noah's day? How are we going to do that? Well, first of all, you take care of your relationship with other believers. That's how you do it. Then you make sure your attitude is right toward people who are angry with you and persecuting you, your enemies. Make sure your attitude's right with them. And you make sure that you've got a right attitude toward life itself. I'm convinced that God has called us to learn to enjoy life, I think, now more than ever before. I think we should be enjoying life now more than ever before. Because God doesn't want us to just endure until he returns. I mean, he hasn't called us to just wait with sadness until the rapture comes and then he takes us out of all this mess. I mean, I, 
God has called us to enjoy the life he's given to us right now. This is our life that he's given to us. It's a gift. Enjoy the gifts God gives us. Amen? Amen. Enjoy it. And no matter how hard the pressures are, if things are right on the inside of you, then you can have a kind of joy and a kind of peace that the world won't understand but envies and wants. Mm -hmm. And you know what the blessings of all of this is? Look at the last verse, 1 Peter 3, 12. This is the blessing of all of it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Wow. How would you like to know that God is watching you all the time with tender, loving eyes and listening to you whenever you pray? That's what he's saying is happening. If you, if you live this way... If you live as an integrated person in the body of Christ, a person of integrity in the body of Christ, and he says he's going to watch you and he's going to listen to you, which means he's going to protect you, he's going to hear you, Amen. he's going to be with you. Listen to what I read in a commentary about this particular psalm. Listen, listen to this. This is what one commentary said. It said, this is exactly the harvest reaped by Christians who have thoroughly surrendered to God and are following Him obediently. Their prayers are answered, for they pray in harmony with God's will. Their spirits are in fellowship with God. Their hearts are at rest. Their wills are centered. Their desires are integrated. And then he says, they are not necessarily free from pressure, but the pressure they experience does not arise from their own ambition. They may have disappointments, but they will not be frustrated. If they suffer illness, it will not be caused by their own guilt or tension. If they have tough sledding, it will be designed to try them, not to punish them. Through whatever comes to them, they will be comforted and sustained by their joy in the Lord, and their triumph by grace will actually add spice to their life, end quote. And that's true. I think that's what happens for the Christian who is fully integrated in the body of Christ. One who lives the way Peter is talking about. If we're to stand in these last days, and if we're to remain standing, we have to be that kind of integrated within the Spirit of God and within the body of Christ, one with another. But at the same time, in the process of doing that, we're going to shine like the light that we're supposed to be. We're going to flavor the world like the salt God has called us to be. We will be the salt and light. It's a different way, brothers and sisters, of bringing people to Christ now. Have you noticed that not many people are getting saved these days? Not like they used to? Even Franklin Graham will tell you that. Mm -hmm. He said they're just not getting saved like they used to get saved. Um, I, I think the methodology that we once used for winning people to Christ, whether it's the faith outline, and we used all of these, and they were somewhat successful, somewhat not. The Roman Road to Salvation, all these methodologies that we used, and many churches fought over because it was methodology for witnessing, you know. We've got to have revival services, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, because that's the only way we're going to win people to Christ and stuff like that. I, I, I'm here to tell you, I think as a pastor and watching all this stuff, I think that it's all changed. And I do think it's going back to first century reality. And I think that first century reality is exactly what Peter was talking about. We have to be the salt and light by virtue of who we really are now in Christ. We are fully integrated people. We let our life, our very demeanor, our very behavior become a testimony as to who we are and what and who other people need. Whether it's how we treat our enemies, how we treat one another, amen, and how we treat life, how we love life, how we enjoy life. Do you see how it all comes together? I hope you do, because that's what it's going to take to stand in our culture today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to pause once again to thank you for your word. 
And Lord, we just together recognize that there's a lot of work that we need to do in our lives as we put our lives alongside the teachings and admonishments of your passage of Scripture here in 1 Peter. Lord, we, we know that we need to do more work in regards to our attitude toward other believers, and especially toward our enemies, and Lord, even toward life itself. Help us, Father, not to be discouraged with the problems that we go through. And though they may be immense, though they may be tough and difficult at times, but you haven't called us to always be down in the mouth about it, but you, rather you want us to, to have a joy, Lord, that, that, that radiates from the inside out so that we'd be able to walk through life excited about the possibilities that are ours, the possibilities that are coming, the reality of your return, that, that we can be excited about what's coming, Lord, and not depressed and not angry. Help us to love life like you've called us to love it. Lord, make this passage to be an encouragement to all of us and to those who may hear it everywhere, Father, online or wherever, Lord. Just help us to be able to stand up and to keep on standing in this culture. To your glory and honor, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he fill you with all of his goodness. And may he give you the power you need to stand for his glory and honor. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.